Yeah, please welcome back Mark Cousins. All right. Um, I'll ask a few questions, and then maybe we can we can see what the audience wants to know. Um, I wanted to begin, yeah, with the origins the origins of the film, and and just given um, given your your past work, I'm just curious how you arrived at this as as the subject uh, for for your new film, and then yeah, I thought it would be interesting if we could sort of uh, get into a little bit of what the what your preparations look like and 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 how you sort of uh, how you went about researching, but then also kind of organize organizing. Uh, these ideas, uh, considering uh, how sort of dense with ideas the film is. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'd made one film about the far right before in the 1990s. Is this okay? Is this working? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one film before about Holocaust deniers and uh, uh, in the early 90s. And a lot of my work, as you know, is sort of about visual culture. And this project allowed, you know, combines looking at the far right and visual culture. Uh, you, most of my films, they're my idea, but this wasn't. I, I was approach, approached by the producers, in this case, Andrea Romeo, and he, he had worked with uh, this uh, brilliant guy who I mentioned earlier, Tony Sacucci, and they had um, looked in detail at this film, Annoy, which I had not even heard of. So I was really fresh to that, you know. Um, but immediately they we we they did a Zoom call, and I thought, yeah, I can do this. I think I can do this, you know. And often, you know, those of you who are filmmakers in the room, you you might recognize this. Sometimes you can see the film fully formed almost before you start, you know. And there was a slight feel with that with me and this one. I I knew it should be roughly in six parts, and it should be each of these parts has got a slightly musical theme to it, you know. So I thought it would. Be be slightly sort of sounds too fancy to say, but a symphonic-y structure, you know. Uh, and so when I was asked to do it, and they it was funded, which is always very nice when a film's funded, uh, so I didn't have to raise funding, and um, so I thought, yeah, I can do this. And then in terms of um, you asked about structure and prep, uh, this is where I've got a kind of show and tell thing here. Microphone is on again. Oh, yeah. um, so, um, so usually, as you know, if you again, the filmmakers and others will know that if you write a script, usually a script looks like ninety to hundred pages and A4, etc. But I don't work that way. I was really inspired by the way that David Bowie worked, which is he would write his, um, yeah, he would write dialogue and 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 then. Or, or write write lyrics and then just cut them up and rearrange them. So that's what I always do. And this is the script in this case. Could I ask you to hold yeah, my yeah. microphone? Of course. Um, so so uh, this is the way the script in this particular thing. Look, I might actually need you to help me here as well. Sure. So if you take one end, and I'll take the other end. <coughs> it's quite long. So it's going to take a moment. <laughs> This is so it's it's really good, you know. When you're in an edit suite, it's really good to be able to see the whole film, uh, and really, it's it's really hard to see the whole film. But this is what you know a whole film can look like here, you know. So it goes on and on and on and on. So this was what was in our edit suite, and you see these flickering bits of paper. These were, you know, through so a phrase like "balcony boys," for example. This it actually goes for. Um, you, you have this idea and you think I'll use that somewhere and um, Larry could you come up and help me here for a minute because yeah. yeah. <laughs> what I need is one other pair of hands or or uh, uh, no what's your name Francis, Francis is going to help Larry so I don't need you to thanks so much so um, so uh, individual little moments themes ideas etc but then you know big structural stuff alabatia and then feroce and then basso continuo so these are the big chapters but within that when you're planning a film if you can do the big sheet of paper you can move these little bits of paper around and therefore when you're in the edit the structural work is done you guys can leave that down now, thanks. Um, so the structure work is already done. And so then the hardest thing is 
structural material when you're making a film. So if it's already done in something like this, then you can focus on the moments, the sort of tone, even the poetry, dare I, dare I say. I'm going to be very nervous for the rest of the Q&A with this, <laughs> this, this priceless archival object right here, but uh, I'll try to keep it together. Um, wow, yeah. Uh, and this is not a fancy thing, this is just a very simple way of making it easier in the edit, you know? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, okay, say no more. <laughs> but uh, but uh, then I'm also, um, another device that's like obviously quite striking in the film are these, these uh, you know, this, these staged scenes with, with Albert Rohrwacher. And um, I, was, I was curious at what stage this idea came, you know, kind of came to you, and then, um, yeah, just kind of how the collaboration between the two of you uh, proceeded, um, considering this very kind of singular role that she she sort of plays in the proceedings. So. Yeah, you know, there was a danger that a film like this would only be a background, and you don't want a film to only be background. Compositionally, you need a foreground when you're making something, and so I thought it needed a foreground, and so it needed a real person, like, I, well, I, you know, I, I, it needed to be somebody I thought quite working class, and it needed to be a woman, because, you know, women were treated particularly badly under this regime, so I thought, why don't I write this character? And I've, I've been a fan of Alba Rovacker for the longest time, you know, and and um, I didn't think, and you know, she's super famous and and extremely talented, you know, and, and so I didn't think we would get her, but I've known her sister, Alice Rovaca, for some time, and I emailed Alice and I said, look, is there, do you think anything, any chance that Alba might consider doing this? And I think within 20 minutes she'd said yes. Uh, which is very nice. She, I, I, was, I was lucky enough that she knew my previous work, you know, and she's interested in the subject and her grandparents were partisans and that's her singing the partisan song at the end. And it was a, it was a fantastic collaboration and um, I'm lucky enough to work, work with some great actors and she's really one of them. Um, and so at the end of it, we sort of thought we would like to make other pictures together. Yeah. And then um, maybe I'll just ask one more one more thing, which is about another um, yeah the, the the other sort of like a major element of, of the film, which is like this this uh, vast wealth of like archival material that you're, that you're working with and and um, yeah, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about about a um, about gathering and sort of organizing that material and the way you kind of uh, sculpted it. Uh, to, especially considering what, like, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know that you didn't know Annoy before you came to the film. So I'm sort of wondering how that all, that also kind of uh, enters into it a little bit, you know. On the archive stuff, you know, I think that a lot of filmmakers, if they're using archive, they make the film and then they try and try to find the archive that illustrates the point they're trying to make. And otherwise, the archive footage comes late in the process. But I don't like that personally, you know, because um, uh, I want to, I need to know what the footage is I'm going to use before I'm going to shoot a film like this, you know. So all the, the, uh, all the work, the research that I mentioned earlier was done first. Uh, and so by the time we shot in Rome, uh, I knew the footage, the archive footage really well. I knew the horrible stuff and the useful stuff, and so it meant that I had that in my mind when I was shooting, and that really helped, you know, because then you can frame a shot to cut with something else. On the annoy point, it was crucial that this person I mentioned earlier, Tony Sakuchi, a really important uh, figure in this. Uh, he knew the film so well, and I didn't, and so we got in a room, and he did like a sort of five-hour info dump with me, you know, where we watched the film together. I used a simple camera to record what he said. Some of it I could, you know, some of the analysis there is about editing and the manipulation of editing. I could have probably done that, but I didn't know who these historical figures were, you know, and so I really relied on him to, you know, give me all that information. And, and I guess the risk was to go back to the structural thing, you know, for the first, what, nearly 30 minutes in this film, we're just talking, we're looking in detail at an, an old movie, and that's risky, you know, like from the from a sort of storytelling point of view, you think, well, people will be interested in this. But I thought, if I do it well enough, you know, the first 30 minutes, then people will 
be immersed and therefore they might be ready for the rest of the story which broadens after that and what happens structurally is that we do I think 35 minutes and then we flash back and flash back again. So I just thought, really take your time on this Annoy film, look into it in detail. Hopefully the audience will go with you and then we can move on to the broader atrocities. Yeah. All right, I wanna, yeah, let's, uh, let's see if the audience has any questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring you a microphone and we'll start right here. Um, you guys can rock, paper, scissors for whoever goes first. Um, hi, uh, thank you hi. for this film. Um, just personally, I think you're, you make lyrical poetry out of history and as a fan of both of those things, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, I'm curious about your musical selection process because I know throughout your work, um, there is some, there's usually some very interesting musical cues and like really interesting sound design. They're like your whole sound elements are very interesting. Um, where does music come in your process and how core is it to what you're doing? Thank you. I love working with musicians and I'm lucky enough to have worked with Nena Cherry and PJ Harvey and David Holmes and lots and lots of great uh, musicians. In this case, this film had to be made really fast. This film was made in two months, which is super fast, right? So we had no time to commission music, you know. Uh, the opening piece of music, the opera piece, you know, is not only, you know, I wanted to blast Donald Trump out in a way from the soundtrack, but I also, M Mussolini made a famous speech in Milano, uh, standing on the stage where Madame Butterfly had just been performed. And so that's why I use Madame Butterfly at the start to their, their particular historical reason. And then after that, I needed to use pre-recorded music and I just wanted to um, use different types of music that had a kind of symphonic quality and would would be a kind of breathing space uh, but there was no time to commission any m music I mean it literally we shot we shot in February and we had basically 99% fine cut in the beginning of April so very very fast um, I'm curious about, you've got such a, a distinctive voice, literally, and I'm curious about the evolution of both the writing of the dialogue and the performance of them both in a given film and over the course of your career. Um, to what degree is there a, a narrator character performance, and what is that on-off switch for you? Thank you. Um, I always write to an image like never never could i write something and then look for the image to illustrate that so in any any films that i make where my voice is there i'm always sitting in the edit suite looking at the image and that's why in a lot of my films there's a lot of present tense this here now etc i want you to feel that we're together just you and me watching together. Uh, when I record the voice, it's always mic'd very, 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 very close like this. You know, and I record it just in my own bedroom and, you know, it needs to be, you know, intimate in a way, you know, velvety almost, I think, you know, and so that kind of, um, th they're the two principles for me. It should be present tense, not past tense. I, I, even though in this film, it sounds as if I know a lot, I still, want, like, especially towards the end when we're looking at Josephine Baker and things like that, I, f I feel, I want you to feel the excitement that I'm feeling when I'm looking at Josephine Baker or Johnny Weissmuller or Pier Paolo Basolini or any of these people, you know. So present tense and intimate are the two principles for me. Hello, Hi. Mr. Mark. Hi. Yes, so I think your movie shows the art of montage. And, uh, but you know that it's interesting to realize that the political figure themselves, it, it seems like treat their identity like the art of montage. Like, 
Donald Trump and also a political figure passed away two days ago, which is the Berlusconi. So, you know, the, I think the process of this, this, this trying start from Mussolini because Mussolini, you know, trying to prove, prove or, you know, to the, the soccer culture, try to build a connection with it, like Inter Milano. So, and also we realized the Berlusconi also bought AC Milan a lot of years ago. And also, because your movie slightly mentioned about soccer, football, and uh, also he, ha like Berlusconi have his own media empire. So my question is, you know, this montage are easily to like the public or the normal people obsession with pop culture because it seems like the pop culture and the political figure as gradually, you know, combine with, with each other and make themselves more adorable like Donald Trump. So. <laughs> So Adorable like Donald Trump, yes. I, I, I'm, no, I'm with you. I'm, I'm as with an you. outsider, is, yeah. I just want to express my... Thing. Sure. Yeah. So do, do you think, you know, in this situation, the cinematographer or the director still can let the, 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 the public know this is dangerous? And to show the obsession is dangerous, do you think there is a way to, 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 to let them realize it? You know, you know, Mussolini was uh, educated and believed in theater and thought of himself, as we say in the film, as an artist, you know. Some of the other people who were influenced by Mussolini were definitely not like that. Berlusconi was definitely not like that. Ber Berlusconi was anti-art, anti-creativity, for example, you know. Donald Trump is anti-art, anti-creativity, et cetera, you know? So the, 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 all these dictators and all these fascists, you know, they have some things in common. They all want to destabilize the system, I think, you know? But, so, but a, a beyond that, some of them are revolutionaries and some of them are not. Franco, for, Franco was not a revolutionary. He was an old school conservative. He just wanted to rewind the clock back. Donald Trump is totally a revolutionary. He wants to upend the system, get rid of the enlightenment values, make us not believe anymore in things like science or facts, you know? And so the, your question about the creativity of these people, some of them were and some of them weren't. Mussolini was, I think, but most of the rest of them are not. Their energy and their force comes from something else. Donald Trump, you know, it's, it's terrible to ruin our evening by talking about him, you know, but Donald Trump is a kind of, kind of nuclear narcissist, you know, that energy, that unbelievable atomic energy coming from the desire to be the center of the universe, you know, and that's not creative, that's profoundly uncreative, you know, and, and then you could raise another, I don't know if there's the implication in your question, but there's the role of cinema in all of this, you know, and, you know, cinema, we'd love to think of cinema as a force for good in the world, wouldn't we? But cinema's, you know, been done terrible things as well as great things, you know. I was having dinner with a friend of mine last night and she was talking about the fact that the bad stuff that cinema has done done you know and so we cannot uh, all we all love cinema in this room but we cannot say that it's always been a force for good as this uh, example of annoy suggests what sally one second um i guess all roads lead to rome I, you know, I, um but to, for his point I did think it was interesting that today Italy was in mourning, and it's wonderful to see this film in the same day. Yeah. And I just think it's a really counterculture statement. But my question it goes back to the Masons. I didn't know any of that. That was totally uh, new to me, a revelation. And I was his name Palermo, Palermitani, Palermotani? Yes, Palermo. Um, Palermi. You don't mention, you mention that many are killed. And I just wonder, did it, did it ever come up what happened to him, what came of him? I, I also wondered that because his, his name would somewhat uh, indicate that maybe he was Jewish. I don't know. I have not heard it suggested that he's Jewish. I've got an antennae for that, and so I think I would have heard that, heard that but I might be wrong. 
But do you know what happened to him? I, was he one of I those think I used to know what happened to him, and I've... <laughs> I remember asking David Lynch something once, and he said, I used to know, you know? So I use that a lot. So this, sorry to answer your question in a bad way, but I used to know that, I think, but I don't anymore, you know? The thing about the Masons, it's no big surprise, is it really, you know? And it's sort of, you, you think behind, if you draw back the curtain, like in The Wizard of Oz, you're often gonna find the Masons there in some role, I think, I suspect, exactly. you know? And um, this is not, totally new information here. It's been known for a while, you know, but we tried to just sort of reveal it um, more clearly, you know, and I'm very interested in that idea of the puppeteers, who are the people behind the people, you know, and, you know, and in, in your country here, where we're sitting now, you've got figures like Steve Bannon, who played a role as a strategist in some way, you know, and not to say that, you know, he is totally to, to blame for what happened, but he was certainly a thinker in the background, pulling some strings at and a you certain... you know he went to Rome to try to yeah. start that whole movie. Yeah, and, and he's, you know, uh, and, and he then set up that, you know, right-wing uh, movement in Europe as well. So there are, the, you know, I, what we don't want to do is become conspiracy theorists and say, oh, there's this big thing behind the scene, you know, but there are often thinkers uh, behind the egotists and they see the power of the ego and they think, I can use that, I can deploy that to do some damage. And then this person here has had his hand up for quite some time. One of the films uh, you Hi. used, uh, well, I'm pretty sure was uh, Two Arms, We Are Fascists. There was that little segment, uh, I think, about with narration over um, Mussolini just like you know, pretending to be a farmer and things like that. Uh, was that, was, was that the film you used? Um, and I remember that film being also about... Sorry, I didn't hear the beginning. Which film? Are there? Uh, I think it's called, like, Two Arms, We Are Fascists. Two Arms to be a fascist? Two Arms, We Are Fascists. It was, oh, um, I, oh that, that documentary about the history of fascism? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, was that, like, an inspiration, or was that, like, a film you kind of referenced when thinking about the structure or the tone of your film? And also, in general, just... What kinds, like, films, fiction, and documentary did you find in your research that, how, how did you decide which ones to use? Yeah, that one, and that one was useful because it had so much footage in it. Structurally, it wasn't of interest uh, f for this movie, but it was so, it had so much material in it that it was very useful. Um, in terms of other things, I knew that this film had to, step away from fascism at some point. It had to look at what else was happening at the time, you know, to sh say, actually, 1922 was a great moment in many ways, you know, and so, uh, so uh, various things like Uno Giornato Particolare, the film with Sofia Loren and Marcello Mastroani, you know, it was good to get in there, that in there, you know, because that was the, you know, it's about, a, as I say, a woman and a gay man, and, you know, so it was really good, nice to get that in there. But um, more generally, by the time I got over there, I thought, enough already, you know? I do not want to hear, you notice we do not hear Mussolini's voice once in the whole movie. That was a decision, I'm not going to let us hear this man's voice. But when we got to there, I was looking at other films, like by Pier Paolo Pasolini and Bernardo Bertolucci, who were commenting on this, who could take us outside, you know, who could do a kind of drone shot around this field and um, remind us that even at this bad time in history, there were also great things happening. I don't think that totally answers your question, I'm sorry. Hello. Um, thank you very much. I, I was curious how you sort of balanced dealing with the aesthetic dimensions of fascism, given that it's often so misleading. I mean, particularly in Hanoi, it was a great illustration, but even the symbol of the fascists or the names that they used. I mean, Mussolini was a f former socialist who left, so they stole a bunch of left-wing kind of symbols, rhetoric. Um, how you then balanced the aesthetic critique with uh, the economic aspects that were going on. You mentioned 
the king and other elite interests were behind him. That was very much also the case in, in Germany and even Churchill was very, very Churchill. Cool. So that was a good touch to, to add. So I'm wondering how you our beloved New Yorker news, New York newspaper isn't that disgraceful? With it? Yeah. And yeah, it's oh, there's always when you're making anything, you have to ha think about form and content. And so I think your questions about form and content and fascism, you know, has incredibly bold form and even bolder content. And so you have to look at both. How you know what were the messages, you know, about others and you know and the enemy and women and all sorts of thing. But also, what was the form in which that was delivered? The theatricality and the the signage on the walls and the use of cinema and and both those they're they're both they're they're quite good at both, you know. And um, so that's why. And I am really interested in both the relationship between form and content, and so there's both in this. I think you know, there, in, you know, there's an analysis of formal questions about who's standing where, a pie on a balcony, etc. But there's also hopefully some sense of how many people did they actually murder in each scenario. And I think that that's one of the things I, I don't know, it's not a question, but it, when we were planning, when I was planning this film, I chose all this really angry music and I thought, we're going to use really angry music in this. And we used none of it. We tried the angry music in the edit and it was completely unnecessary because the content is so powerful that you can provide the anger. I do not need to express it on your behalf, you know, and the you know, the worst bits, like when we're looking at Hitler and we're talking about the victims of Nazism, there, there's, not only is there no music, there's basically no sound of any sort because you don't need anything there. We're, we're running out of time, so I want Something I could see like <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah, no, maybe we can keep talking outside. But um, selfishly, I just want to ask the, the last question. Um, sorry, everyone. Um, I was just... Uh, yeah, I, w I was wondering about the, the film's reception in Italy. You premiered in Venice. Um, uh, Venice, of, I think specifically like the part of Venice where the festival uh, uh, happens uh, has some kind of fascist uh, architectural things going on and so on. So I'm just wondering what the, what the atmosphere was like after the film premiered and sort of how that, what that's been like for you. Uh, so we premiered at the opening day of the Venice Film Festival, a big audience, and, you know, oh, Giorgio Maloney, the current um, uh, pre president of, of Italy, is in there, and we put her in quite late, and it's just, it's just there briefly, and, um, you know, I, at no point do we say she's a fascist, you know, but she has said a few things, like she gave a speech in, in Vox in Spain where she said... No to LGBT rights, of course, they all say that, you know. They, but she said yes to the universality of the cross. Yes to the, you know, we are a monoculture. You know, Europe is a Christian nation. That's fascist, you know, so that's why we put her in. So there was a slight reaction, shall we say, when uh, we premiered and, and the press, uh, the right wing press, I think, were very angry, very angry, and denounced it. We were on the front page of a lot of newspapers and credit, huge credit to the producers of this film. You know, I'm not Italian, so I can jump on a flight back to Scotland where I live, but they actually live there, you know, so very, very good that, the, that they, you know, stood up for the integrity of the piece. And then subsequently, the film's been shown in schools in Italy as an educational piece, you know, and and, and I'm pleased about that, but um, the, in the Italian um, parliament, there was a, I was going to say question, I think it was slightly stronger than question, uh, where they, uh, one minister stood up and said that they thought it was very inappropriate that this should be shown in schools, and they mentioned me by name and, and said various things. Um, uh, but to the credit of the general Italian Parliament, the it, the the film was not blocked to be used in schools, and I think, in fact, the bookings in schools went up slightly as a result of this. <laughs> um, that that seems as good a note as any to, to end on for now. Maybe we can keep talking outside. But Mark, thank you very much for this very necessary film, and thank all of you.